Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back with another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyihi wa mustafa Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah wa ba'd. My dear viewers, today's live edition is an episode number 554 in the Blessed Series of Riyadhul Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. Guess what? Today's episode is the 13th in studying the book number 15, Kitab al-Adhkar, chapter number 244, Babu Fadli Zikri wal Hathi Alayhi, the excellence of the remembrance of Allah and encouraging doing it. Without any further ado, the first hadith that we are going to study together today is hadith number 1432. Beautiful hadith, great companion, the narrator, sound, and it is collected by Imam Muslim. And the narrator is Abu Dharr al Ghifari radiyallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. And Abu Dharr radiyallahu anhu. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يصبح على كل سلامة من أحدكم صدقة فكل تسبيحة صدقة وكل تحميدة صدقة وكل تهليلة صدقة وكل تكبيرة صدقة وأمر بالمعروف صدقة ونهي عن المنكر صدقة ويجزئ من ذلك ركعتان يركعهما ركعتان يركعهما من الضحى رواه مسلم. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the sound hadith that every morning charity is due from every joint on behalf of every joint born of the body of every one of you. Every utterance of Allah's glorification, saying Subhanallah, is an act of charity. And every glorification and every praise, saying Alhamdulillah, is an act of charity. And every profession of faith, saying uh, Allahu Akbar, saying La ilaha illallah, that is a profession of faith, is an act of charity. Then every utterance of Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, is also an act of charity. Enjoining what is good is an act of charity. Forbidding what is evil is an act of charity. And if you just offer two rakahs early morning in the forenoon, it will be sufficient. It will suffice you for all of this. I know, mashallah, You've heard this hadith many times and with different narrations speaking about the virtues of the duha prayers. But the hadith does not tackle the duha prayer in this uh, context. It is focusing on the importance of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We did study the hadith before as we spoke about the uh, voluntary prayers, the non-obligatory Namaz, and we spoke about the duha prayer, the witter prayer, the emphatic and the non-emphatic sunan. We learned that salat al-duha is a very virtuous and very great uh, prayer. And uh, if you pray fajr in jama'ah and you sit in your musalla until it is past sunrise, then you pray two rakahs. The Almighty Allah will grant you a full reward of performing hajj and umrah. We've been through all of that. 
But in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ brings to our attention multiple facts. Fact number one, that we should not take the blessings for granted. We should pay attention to the countless blessings of Allah before we lose any of them. I mean, we recognize them as we enjoy them. So if this is the case, then we praise Allah. We know that we can never praise Him enough. We can never say, thank you Allah enough for His countless blessings upon us. The blood circulation, the breathing process, uh, the digestion, the excretion, you know, the execution process is a, is a very sophisticated process. And the uh, dialysis that the kidneys do twice every day while you're asleep, while you're exercising, while you're walking, you don't feel it. So indeed, indeed, as Muslims, we know that وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ No doubt that we can never keep record uh, or estimate the blessings of Allah upon us. And accordingly, if we cannot just keep record and we cannot count them, then how can you thank Allah for their count? So Allah the Almighty will uh, be happy if you just say, I recognize all of that. And you be grateful for all of them collectively. One of the countless blessings of Allah upon us is uh, a ni'mah that most human beings enjoy so long as they're healthy. And only whenever they lose any of them, there are many, many. Okay, but it is the blessings of the joints. You, you know, between every, between every two bones, there is a joint. Whether in the fingers, whether in the toes, whether in the vertebra, whether in the forearm and the, and the hand, the rest. So many joints, so many bones and joints between the joints. Uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ expressed about them in another hadith 360. So if this is the case, a single joint, a form, if it is not functioning, can simply turn somebody's life miserable. Yes, it can. A person can lose his job, can become unemployed if he's having a little desk, if he is not able to lift things, or if he is having gout and severe pain in the joints because of the precipitation of the salts in the joints, so they cannot type, they cannot use a computer. Wallahi, they cannot turn the knob, the door knob. So a physically fit person, but because of the joints are having some, you know, uh, sicknesses. They cannot hold the tap, the faucet, and turn it, open it, or close it, or the door knob. To that extent, I know that, alhamdulillah, those who are healthy, they cannot imagine, they cannot realize how bad, how severe, how terrible it is. But it is terrible. It is indeed terrible. So, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you Muslims, you're different than others. You should not wait until you lose any of the blessings to recognize it. You should not wait until you're treated from sickness. Then you recognize that Allah has been most generous to you, so you start uh, uh, thinking about it and saying Alhamdulillah. No, 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 you should say Alhamdulillah before that. Indeed, one of those blessings is the blessing of the joints, which connects between each two bones, functioning properly. You know, there are some people who are lying on bed and they cannot flip over. And uh, that's why we have to keep uh, a nurse or somebody at home to assist those people to flip over. If they don't, they develop a bit sore, a bit ulcer, and it is really problematic. It ca they can die. In addition to having the DVTs and the blood clots, and you know, these are all life threatening diseases. Subhanallah. So, being able to flip over while you're asleep, sometimes right side, left side, you sleep on your back, you fold your, you bend your legs, you know, you're free to do any of that. Why? Because the joints are functioning properly. Alhamdulillah. Say Alhamdulillah.
How many times you need to say Alhamdulillah countless times? Because every day the 360 joints are functioning properly and we're enjoying them. So every morning when you wake up, you should remember those joints, blessings, and you should say, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, 360 times. Or give thanks equal to the number of the joints in various ways in giving in a charity. And a sadaqa is not only the financial charity, but a sadaqa could be in the form of zikr, subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu referred to by saying, Kullu tasbihatin sadaqa. Every single time you say, Subhanallah, this is an act of charity. Wa tahmidatun sadaqa. Every time you say, Alhamdulillah, all praises be to Allah, you will receive a reward for an act of charity. Likewise for saying, la ilaha illallah, or Allahu Akbar. In joining what is good, and uh, we are, in a way, are commanded, not just encouraged, commanded to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil, everyone within their capacity. Amrun bil ma'rufi sadaqa, nahyun anil munkar sadaqa, these are all acts of charity. In order to make certain that you did really pay the due charity acts and thanks, for just the blessings of the joints or a sulama, it will be sufficient to pray two rak'ahs of the forenoon prayer. Obviously, if you pray four, two by two, it's better. Six or eight, that's even better. But just two rak'ahs in the forenoon, that salatul duha or salatul ishraq is sufficient as means of giving thanks to the blessings which you all enjoy of the joints. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu when he wanted to donate all his wealth so that he would benefit out of it. He wanted to give He thought that he's going to die. He was severely sick and he had only one daughter. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said no. He said have. He said no. He said one third. Obviously after reviewing him a few times he finally said naam. One third but even though one third is too much, but he approved it. Why? Aren't you the one who kept encouraging us to give any charity? So now I want to give all my money in charity. And you say no. So I said two thirds and said no. Have you still said no? So why not? Doesn't Allah encourage us in the Quran? Man zalladhi yuqridu Allah qardan hasanan fayudha'ifahu lahu adhafan kathira. Allah wants us to give any charity so that he will multiply the reward for it. True. But in the case of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, he was lying down on his bed and he assumed that he's not going to make it. So he wanted to give away all his wealth. What about the ears? Well, it was only one door. So the Prophet ﷺ said, It is better, it is better to leave your ears, your family members behind, inheritors, rich, than leaving them poor, begging help from others. You already have. And then the Prophet ﷺ explained, Do you guys think that the sadaqah, the act of the charity, is only limited to giving to the poor? La. Nahi. No. Nada. The act of the charity in respect of spending applies to giving to your family members, your own children, yes. Buying food for them, charity. Buying outfit and clothes for them, charity. Somebody is sick and you rush into the hospital and you paid for the ambulance and you bought the medications. Sadaqat, charity. You're spending all of this for the sake of Allah. He you invited your honey, your mastura, your wife uh, for a vacation and you're dining outside and you say, honey, take this for me and you feed her. Charity. Provided you intend that. Now everyone will get the reward for it unless if you intend it. Because the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Deeds are by, but by their intentions. So as long as, alhamdulillah, you're spending this in lawful resources, 
and you're buying lawful things, then with your intention, this is fi sabilillah, wallahi, you will be rewarded for it. This is an act of charity. وَعْلَمْ يَا سَعْدْ أَنَّكَ لَنْ تُنْفِقَ نَفَقَةً تَبْتَغِي بِهَا وَجْهَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكَ بِهَا أَجْرًا حَتَّى اللُّقْمَةَ تَضَعُهَا فِي فِي مْرَأَتِكَ يَا سَعْدْ أو سَعْدْ أو ما أنكل I guess you need to learn that every spending of yours as long as you seek the pleasure of Allah out of it you will be rewarded for it it's an act of charity including whatever you feed your wife if this is your intention, this is a generous act, an act of charity, you will be rewarded for it. Then the Prophet ﷺ in a similar hadith emphasized that not everyone can actually give a financial charity. Um, I want to share with you something. It just popped up in my mind, by the way. It was not premeditated. As you know what happened with the big blast in, in, in Lebanon, in, in Beirut. So immediately when the brothers in the UK called me and they said, we need to raise immediate emergency fund for them, I said, of course, my page is available. And alhamdulillah, mashallah, the viewers did very well, as I was told, alhamdulillah. Then I was reading one of the comments, how I like I was rich so that I can contribute. So I thought I need to share with the viewers that by the way, when you go through the contribution list, it is not like a thousand or two or three or ten grains. No. Wallahi, five bucks, four bucks, three bucks, seven bucks, twenty bucks, fifty bucks. I mean, it's not a big deal. So one should not miss any opportunity. Especially when you, whenever you trust the organization. I have confirmed many times as a person, I'm just giving my page or my effort or my advertisement for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think those people are reliable. I believe so. And mashallah, today they sent some videos, started distributing, mashallah, uh, the provision for the affected people in Beirut. This is called the financial charity. Not everyone can afford it, even though it is very little. And when you swipe your card, when you submit the card number, and you say, I'm giving $5, five pounds. Thank you, that's a, a sandwich. If you go to Burger King, if you buy a shawarma sandwich, falafel sandwich out of New York is $6, $5.99, right? It's not even a, a meal, that's a, a fast meal. So everyone, everyone should take advantage of every opportunity. I'm not talking about only an opportunity which is presented by Huda or by peace or by any, anywhere. Whenever you have a chance, spend here and there. Along with that, the Prophet ﷺ said, perhaps some people cannot afford the five bucks or the three dollars. Then tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika sadaqa. By merely smiling when you meet your brother, Allah will record it for you as an act of charity. Guess what? So the sister said, I wish I was rich to contribute, but I am making dua for my brothers and sisters. That means a lot. Yes, sister, that means a lot. It could be better than <coughs> excuse me. other financial contribution. Alhamdulillah. All of that simply because we're dealing with the most generous. He wants to see you sincere, and taking the initiative, then he would rain you with goodness. He would flood you with his provision, whether the good deeds, the reward, the hasanat, or the um, you know the replacement of your spending with plenty of risk and provision. Man jaa bil hasanati, falahu ashru amthalih. So we learned that do not forget how much you owe Allah Subhanahu wa Taala of thanks and praises for one single. Na'ma for one single blessing, which is what? The joints. Subhanallah, I'm just sitting on the chair, leaning over, sitting back, uh, you know, reclining. All of that because of those joints by the leave of Allah are flexible, are functioning. I'm sure you know that the joints are not only between the two bones and the fingers and the toes in the wrist and in the arm, in the elbow and uh, uh, shoulders and the hips, also 
in the skull. In the skull, if you have ever seen a skull before, a real skull, you will see something similar to the zipper. <coughs> Excuse me. These are called sutures. In anatomy, the sutures in the skull categorized are categorized as joints. Why? Because, and what is the purpose of having those sutures anyway? Uh, the purpose in case that somebody got hit in the head. In a reason or another, for a reason or another, so those sutures, you know, like teeth, would allow the skull to glide, the pieces glide against each other, so that they will protect the brain from having a concussion. Allahu Akbar. So it is not like a one single piece, an intact piece. No, it is divided. I wish we have a skull so that we can show you, but maybe one day, inshallah. And it's all available uh, online. You can watch it in a medical video or so, or in an anatomy uh, video. Just for the purpose of reminding how generous, how great, is the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala providing us with the means of protection. Yet, yet, we do things, we throw ourselves in harm's way by all our own hands. Boxing. Then the person starts having Parkinsonism, uh, losing concentration, losing balance. Why? He's received hundreds of hits in the brain. Is that right? No, that is not permissible. This is one of the sports which is absolutely forbidden in Islam. The following hadith. Hadith number 1433. An ummi al-mu'minina juwayriyata bint al-harithi radiyallahu anhum. Anna al-nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallama kharaja min indiha bukratan hina salla al-subha wa hiya fi masjidiha. ثم رجع بعد أن أضحى وهي جالسة فقال ما زلت على الحال التي فارقتك عليها قالت نعم فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لقد قلت بعدك أربع كلمات ثلاث مرات لو وزنت بما قلت منذ اليوم لوزنتهن سبحان الله وبحمده عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة عرشه ومداد كلماته وفي رواية له سبحان الله عدد خلقه سبحان الله رضا نفسه سبحان الله زنة عرشه سبحان الله مداد كلماته I'm not going to take the rest of the narrations because it would serve the same purpose so for the sake of time the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, once when he had spent the night in the hujra, the chamber of Juwayriya bint al-Harith radiyallahu an, uh, whose father was the master, the chieftain of Banil Mustaliq. And you know the story how they all came to accept Islam. And so maybe I will uh, swing by to shed some light on it. So she has become one of the mothers of the believers. The Prophet sallallahu left to pray Fajr. And when he returned after Duha, so we're talking about an hour and a half, approximately. It could be more than, it could be more than that. But at least, you know, if you pray Fajr and you remain in the Musalla until uh, 15, 20 minutes past sunrise, then you pray the Duha. So I'm assuming it was an hour and a half. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returned home. And there he found Juwariya bint al-Harith sitting in the same place, he said, have you been sitting in the same place ever since I left you? She said, certainly. Naam. The Prophet ﷺ said, you know what? Uh, and and Juwariya was sitting making zikr. He said, after I left you, I recited four words and I repeated them three times after I had left you. If these words to be weighed against all you have recited since morning, they will be heavier in the scale. Allahu Akbar, what are those words which you recited three times and how much time does it take? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that he said, Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Actually, that is the only praise in the dhikr. 
to say subhanallah bihamdi indeed Allah is free from any imperfection and alhamdulillah for guiding me to this reality what do you say subhanallah bihamdi I said subhanallah bihamdihi as many times as the number of his creatures and in accordance with his good pleasure yani as many times as it pleases him and as huge and as heavy as equal to the weight of his throne and equal to the ink that may be used in recording the words of praise oh that's a very very comprehensive praise what is it again subhanallah wa bihamdi adada khalqi wa rida nafsi wa zinata arshihi wa midada kalimati it's even easy to memorize and it is very lovely thick brothers and sisters I know somebody would say well if this is the case so why don't I just recite it and that's it yes you're right you may recite it and that's it and you may recite it and you recite along with it the prescribed azkar then you are a better winner right and sometimes whenever you are on a hurry uh, you're having an exam you need to catch a ride you are a doctor and you have a surgery uh, you're a train driver so you pray fetch and you gotta leave so on the way you don't have a chance to make subhanallah wa hamdihi 100 times or more la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la 100 times or more astaghfirullah say the istighfar so i would say subhanallah wa bihamdi adad khalqi wa rida nafsi wa zinat arshi wa midad kalimati and you repeat this dua three times so that is better than sitting for a couple hours of reciting a constant dhikr. Allah is the most generous. May the Almighty Allah accept all our good deeds and forgive us and pardon us for all our bad deeds. Ameen. It's time to take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple minutes for some more. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, our phone numbers and they also should appear on the bottom of the screen for the reminder beginning with the area code 002 then 0238551331 alternatively area code 002 then 0100546923 uh, whatsapp numbers area code 001347806 and finally area code 001 361-489-1503 uh, Waiting anxiously for your calls We have Sister Zinat from the USA Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh How are you Dr. Muhammad? Alhamdulillah Sister Zinat I'm doing fine and you? Alhamdulillah great Okay I have one question Like yes. most of the time During the pandemic uh, I have one son and one daughter and my husband. Usually either my son leave the prey or my husband. Mm. But sometimes the children are here and there. So I have a question. If my husband is leading the namaz and I can lead behind him, so it's called jamaat or not? Yes, it is jamaat. Jamaat is oh. achieved by uh -huh. having any two people, any adults. Okay. So okay. when your so, husband is leading you in the prayer, in any of the five mm -hmm. daily prayers, that's a jama'ah. Okay. And second thing, I want to thank you to the Huda team and you especially, Masal and USA. Me and my family, we are learning a lot. What we don't know, we are learning from your program. So Jazakallah khair for everything. All praises and thanks to Allah. I'm very glad to hear that. And I'm sure my colleagues, everyone behind the cameras, are very pleased to hear that. And I'm sincerely from the bottom of my heart asking Allah Almighty during these difficult times to support Huda TV to continue broadcasting its useful uh, programs. 
in case that there is any interruption, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be more than happy to resume from home at the same time, inshallah. It won't be the same quality and the same clearance, but uh, we'll do our best. Thank you, Sister Zinat from the USA. Assalamu alaikum. Amina from India. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amina, how are you? You sound, Amina, you sound really, really young. Do you know how old are you? What is your age? Amina, four years old. Oh my God, MashaAllah. We have a viewer from India and she's four years old and she's watching Gardens of the Pious. MashaAllah. Amina, you have all the time you want in the world. So what do you have in mind today? Do you have any questions? I have a question. I have a question. Why I can't yes. Why I can't see Allah and angels? You will, inshallah. You know, Amina, you're very young. And whenever you're young, you can see a lot of I huge things. Inshallah. Okay, I got your question. Amina is four years old and is asking, why can't I see Allah and the angels? So I say, indeed, inshallah, when we enter paradise, we'll get to see Allah physically. And obviously, we'll get to see the angels as well. If you get to see Allah, then you get to see anything else. But not everyone will get to see Allah, Amina. Only the very good people the Almighty Allah said in the Quran, Some faces will be so beautifully bright on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because of reflecting the nur of Allah. Looking at Allah, they will get to see Allah. So Allah said in the Quran that His loved ones will get to see Him in Jannah, inshaAllah. May Allah make you and your entire family, your lovely parents, and make all of us among them. You made my day, Amina. MashaAllah, what a beautiful name. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amina from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have two questions to ask you. Sure. Um, I want to ask you if you can tell me about the legality of in Islam about constructing a, a Hindu temple by public funds. And my second question is connected to this, that a group of uh, friends that I have, they wanted to draft a letter to send it to the Islamic Ideology Council, who's going to give a final verdict on this. And they all wanted, to, wanted me to help, and I wanted to help as well. But I don't want to disclose my name on the letter because of the emotional stress that people cause then because most of my friends and they think it's okay to make them under so is it okay if i want to conceal my name but i want to help them because they feel that it's kind of hypocritical if i want to help but i don't want to tell conceal i don't want to show my name to public what is the Can content of the letter on, on uh, this? sister amna what is the content of the letter, the letter what is it all about in the letter we're going we were going to tell the ideology center how there is no such religious freedom in the world where public funds are used to construct even mosques or temples or any other place of worship. So religious freedom in Pakistan does not include the right of Hindus to have a mandir constructed by using tax, taxpayers' money. So that's the one way. And the second issue we're going to write about is the Sharia uh, rules on that, that the Sharia is clear on it. Because I do feel it can't be allowed, but the other side, they argue, Surah Hajj, that Allah preserved uh, some churches, and that's why it's allowed to make worship places by using public Muslim money. Okay, so thank you, Amina, for presenting these two questions. I think I was right when I asked you what are the contents, what will be written in the letter? Because 
In fiqh, we were taught al-hukmu ala shay'i far'un an tasawwurihi. How can I say, yes, it is allowed or not allowed without knowing what is allowed and what is not allowed? What is the question all about? So, answering the first question will take care of your second question. Is it permissible to build a non-Muslim place of worship from the Muslim public fund? The answer is general consensus, 100% agreed upon among all the Muslim scholars. No, it is not. Why not? You know, if you ask me, can we build a public hospital which would treat Muslims and non-Muslims, followers of all different faiths and religions, including those who don't believe in God, from the Muslims fund, is it permissible? I'll say, yes, it is permissible. Distributing food to the poor, all of whom Muslims and non-Muslims from the Muslim fund, is it permissible? Yes, it is permissible. But building a place of worship where people invoke other than the Almighty and ask from other than the Creator and they prostrate themselves to other than the founder of the universe, I am not allowed to do that. Why not? I'm not allowed as an individual even to contribute towards that. And please observe the vast difference between being humane, between being kind, between fulfilling the very Islamic teachings in respect of honoring your neighbors, co-citizens, respecting all people, in respect of their faith and their ideology. But not assisting in doing anything that displeases the Almighty Allah. Check out ayah number two, chapter number five, Surah Al-Ma'idah, in which the Almighty Allah says, وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ You're not allowed to participate or to take part or assist or help by any means, directly or indirectly, in constructing or in doing or achieving anything which is forbidden, which is a sin, which is a form of transgression. وَلَا تَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ So I'm not even allowed to sign on such letter, Sister Amina, let alone concealing my name or exposing my name. It's about, is the letter okay? No, it is not okay. And again, I'm talking about in a Muslim society, in a Muslim country. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tuba from India. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, Tuba, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I I called in previously and uh, um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I asked you about the fee, whether it is uh, mandatory or not. And you said sister, it's, sister it's Tuba, time. sister Tuba, I, I cannot get yes. any of what you're saying. Sound is not clear to me. Are you are you talking from the speakerphone? Sorry? Sorry? Are you talking from a speakerphone? Yes, I'm talking from a speakerphone. Uh, can you talk from the handset, not from the speakerphone, please? If you're on the speakerphone, oh. turn it off and, uh, and just talk to me from the handset, please. Um, is my voice clear now? Yes, yeah, much better. Okay. Um, so, my question was, um, you have said previously, uh, that taqirid is prescribed for a layman. Now, when I tell this to my mother, though I accept it, when I tell her uh, that we have said this, she has a um, question in response to that. That um, we follow Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaah. We are or not Shia or we are not of some other sect. We belong to the same sect. So if we belong to the same sect, we can ask any scholar uh, of that sect any question that you want. For example, I am not bound to ask every question in my life to you only. I can ask some question to Sheikh Asim also, for example. I'll give you an example. Because he is of the same sex. So she says this. Also she says that um, anyone can call you from all over the world. You do not have something on your website that says only people who follow Dr. Muhammad Salah can ask questions over there. So she has these cross questions and I don't know what to answer. So I would like to ask you only because you have advice. Well, Sister uh, Tuba, as far as for the yes. first part of your question, your mom is right. So if you ask Sheikh Asim and he answers you and you take his answer, you act upon it, you're cool, you're okay. You ask your local imam 
whom you trust that he is an imam and he is educated and he knows fiqh and he answers you and you follow his instructions, you're okay, you're great. Uh, and whether myself or any imam on earth or any sheikh or any professor of comparative fiqh, we do not necessarily have to have the answer ready for every mas'ala. I do not necessarily have to answer every single time somebody is asking me because I'm not an encyclopedia. I'm not infallible either. So the Almighty Allah says, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ And also you may know very well, but you still may err. Okay? So what matters is, you as a layman, you have a mas'ala, you have a concern, you pick up the phone, you ask somebody whom you trust. He gives you the answer, you act upon it, you're perfectly okay. Even if it was wrong, you're not blameworthy. You're not required to do anything beyond that. Thank you, Sister Tawbah. Barakallahu fiki. Sister Maryam from the UK. Hello. Naam. Assalamu alaikum, Maryam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. Uh, I have. Hello. I hear you. Sister Maryam, please proceed on. I hear you. Mudassir from Finland. Sister Maryam from the UK will be waiting for your call again. Mudassir, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi sheikh. Uh, I have a question today. Yes, please. Uh, let's say if, if, I, if I sell a product on installments and later if the buyer is unable to pay, then what is my right as a seller? Uh, how do I get back my leftover amount from the buyer? Uh, so I would like to know in, the, in this context, inshallah. Well, it depends on what kind of guarantee that you have taken on him. On Normally, people um, who have a good credit score, they pay on time. And if they don't, then you can sue them so you can collect your money in addition to any overhead or any cost that he encountered that's like you know if you have sold some valuables or vehicles or real estate or whatever i'm not really sure i'm not a businessman with regards to the small objects that uh, you know sometimes it will cost you more to take somebody to court but i'm sure there's something that they do in order to secure the rights um, but it is your right to include that in the contract in the beginning. So some people actually do not hand over the item until the price is paid fully. Um, every business transaction is based on the agreement of the seller and the buyer. Al-aqd shari'atul muta'aqidain. Barakallahu feek, akhi muddathir. Maryam from the UK, Assalamu alaikum. Sister Mayam. <laughs> Naam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother, I have only one question. Uh, my husband had accident two years back at work. He was paid for the accident for the one month, but people say says that we have to claim compensation from the company for the accident and the for the loss he got he got cut on his year and he got uh, 20 or something stitches so is it permissible in islam to claim compensation from the company like well, it is in short mm, i don't know yeah it is permissible if the company fell short in protecting him or providing him with the proper means of protection okay okay uh, so this is something have to be discussed with the legal advisor with the lawyer and you check out with the uh, with the local law, uh, you're calling from the UK. Um, yeah. The, the, you know, Sister Mariam, um, I, I know some people who actually, they pretended falling or breaking, uh, you know, some of their bones on arm or leg or whatever in order to claim some compensation from the company and early retirement. This is haram. This is definitely unlawful. And whatever earning they collect out of that is unlawful. But somebody, Due to working in some place and due to the working uh, measurement, he got hit and it affected him. It affected his earning. 
So it is the duty of the company to compensate him for that. And if he's working for the government, he would have a compensation for life, monthly salary, and so on. All of that is permissible if the company is liable. We ran out of time, my dear brothers and sisters. Didn't get a chance to uh, go through your questions, but I will, inshallah, hopefully, at home. And uh, do not forget um, that we need to tell Huda TV uh, nowadays whether these guys have been doing a good job or not. And we need to tell them that whether we have been praying for them or not, we are asking Allah for them to continue and to maintain success and to even get better. Your prayers and your spiritual support really means a lot during this difficult time. And also suggest to us, what would you like to see in the future in case that we will continue? And otherwise, what would you like to do? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support all of us and grant us forgiveness. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And all the glory to him He only humans to be the best And give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to him He only humans to be the best And give his best religion to them So why did they ignore that Forgetting all about it in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price